Rootkits are an interesting little animal in that they are both malware and not malware. There's actually no real easy way to explain rootkits other than describing what they do. What they do is they hide stuff from users and from processes. The trick there is that stuff could be an attack tool, could be a keyboard sniffer, monitor, could be some type of privilege escalation, or it could be a legitimate user wanting to run something that conflicts with another component of the system. It could be a legitimate administrator that wants to hide some tools and run some tools in the background that either they shouldn't or that maybe conflict with something. So rootkits can actually be a useful type of software, a useful category. In fact, that's where they got their start. But primarily, they are a wrapper and a cloak for other types of code. They are not malicious by themselves. But there are a lot of malware scanners, a lot of processes, a lot of intermediate devices that flag rootkit signatures as malware immediately. Rootkits are almost always designed to cloak something and keep the execution of something quiet, whether it is a backdoor, whether it's a nefarious proxy, whether it is some type of, of sniffing and reporting engine. It's designed to make it so that a user or even administrator can't see what's going on, can't see that execution. They maybe can footprint that something's using a little bit of memory, sometimes not even that, or sometimes something's using a little bit of hard disk space, but that's almost impossible to trace nowadays and also probably not going to get caught. Oftentimes, because of the rootkit's stealth ability and the way they're designed, they can be installed by an unprivileged user. An unprivileged user almost always has certain rights on a system like installing a printer driver or installing a keyboard driver or being able to connect to the internet for updates. All of those kinds of things could potentially allow a rootkit to get in. And when a rootkit gets into a system, it compromises the system in such a deep and insidious and transparent way that it's nearly impossible to get that thing back out unless you nuke it from orbit, literally just wipe and reload the system. And even still, in some cases, rootkits can persist across reinstalls and wipe and reloads. It really depends on the rootkit itself. But they are designed almost universally to not be removable within the context of the system. So booting up Windows and running a malware scanner, if a rootkit's been installed, the scanner is probably going to get fooled by the rootkit. No, there's no rootkit here. Kind of a Jedi mind trick thing. And the rootkit doesn't get detected. Continues to protect what it's protecting. It's that cloak technology. These are really elegant and really difficult to get rid of, much easier to defend against from the defender side. As an attacker, these are awesome to get installed because they make sure that you will be able to get back in. Remember, however, that you actually may have trouble getting it back off the system, so you have to stay within scope and boundaries. If part of your scope is not do anything that cannot be undone simply and easily, you may want to take a close look at which rootkits you're selecting and which you're not. Just like with other types of malware that you'll learn about in the malware video, rootkits are all about packaging something up, delivering it, and hiding it. And typically speaking, I buy rootkits. When I need to conduct this type of attack, I'm going to look for a rootkit author who's actually designing their rootkits so that they're not detected by current malware scanners, that they hide within the target systems that I'm looking to infect and do not cause system instability. Because of the deep infection level and the deep level at which they have to penetrate the operating system to cloak, these things can be extremely unstable. They can blue screen a Windows box. They can hard hang virtually any system in the world uh, if they're not written really, really carefully. So as an attacker, as an ethical hacker, what I'm looking for here is determining what payload I want to run in a very, very quiet, nefarious way, maybe a nefarious proxy or some type of sniffer, and then finding a rootkit packager that can actually bundle that up and run it and infect a system with it. Oftentimes, I will have to deliver it, but that's fine because at this point, I've got a username and password. I can log in or access the system well enough to launch the rootkit and have the rootkit hide itself. And now I've completely compromised the system. Much like a rootkit, spyware is all about getting 
the system compromised in a way that I can watch what's going on, whether that's monitoring network activity, monitoring keyboard activity, monitoring screen captures, all that kind of stuff. Spyware has kind of a rough name because it's generally considered something that pops up ads on the internet, you know, ads for buy this prescription illegally or ads for look at this pornographic site. Those kinds of things are considered spyware because they're pop-ups or they're, uh, they're trying to get your bank account information, stuff like that. In an ethical hacking scenario, spyware is usually much, much, much more elegant where it is the software version of what you saw earlier, a keylogger, or it's a VNC client that's transparent that just transmits the screen captures periodically to the attacker, but doesn't actually take control, doesn't change what's going on on the system. This kind of spyware is far harder to detect because in most cases, spyware is only detected by the user visually, and then it gets removed or remediated. It's kind of rare that spyware, when it doesn't set off flags and alarms that are visible and noticeable, it's kind of rare for that to get detected and removed. Notice the process here for spyware is virtually identical to the rootkit process. You've got to have some level of access in order to stealthily install it on the target machine, so you need to compromise the system in some way. Then you either go buy or develop your own spyware package, distribute it, run it, and then sit back and monitor. Not different at all, really.